Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Ute Dash. I am one of your hosts today, Sammy Mora. And as always, I am joined by the lovely Cole Bagley. Cole, are you, how are you today? Well, Sammy, you just make me feel good when you say the lovely Cole Bagley because nobody really calls me that besides you. So I'm doing pretty good. Well, you are lovely. You are lovely. <laughs> so I'm doing okay. Um, I didn't expect Utah to play as good as they did last night in the first half. I kind of expected how the game went in the second half and the overall outcome of the game. So I'm okay because we saw spurts of greatness, but then last week's team reared its ugly face and we lost. So I, I'm okay. Yeah, so that's actually you, – you literally just jumped right into this, didn't you, today? You, were, you just want to, to talk about it. He's ready to talk about this. So what went wrong? It was good until it wasn't. That's what I'll say. Um, it was really, really, this was the tale of two halves for Utah, if you really think about it. First first half, it looked like a team that we would have seen last year. Like, they, the offense was doing good, the defense was go, doing good. It was a good first half, 21 points, which is more than we can say we scored in the first game against USC. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was really happy. I was like, this is really good. We're looking good. And then the second half came. And that that was not fun. I don't know what happened. Um, it just looked like we were playing USC again. Like, did they take their foot off the gas? Did they go conservative on the play calling? What was the deal? It was just not good. The first half made last week's game against USC look like a fluke. I mean, the pass game was good. The run game was great. And the defense honestly looked elite. Um Then Washington came out and scored a touchdown, stole the momentum, and the team who played USC returned. And so I just, Sammy, I was kind of breaking down the game, looking at stats on offense and defense from the first and second half, and it's it's pretty remarkable, the difference. So the first half, offensively, Utah scored 21 points, 221 yards, four of seven on third down, and they averaged 6.3 yards of play. That means every two two downs is a first down and more. Um, compared to the second half, zero points, 138 yards, two for seven on third down, an average 4.6 yards of play. Now looking defensively, they allowed no points, which was a huge surprise. Only 127 yards um, against Utah's defense. Washington was 0-6 on third down, which I didn't realize. Um, and they only averaged 4.5 yards of play compared to the second half. Utah allowed 24 points, 233 yards. Washington was four four of seven on third down, and they averaged 6.5 yards a play. So it's almost like the two teams, it's almost like they just switched uniforms. It's like, oh, totally. It's like Washington played in the second half, like Utah played in the first half, and vice versa. And it just really frustrating. And what it came down to, it seems, is halftime adjustments. Um, Washington started to attack more effectively especially through the air, is they completed six of seven passes, two of which were touchdowns to the tight end, Cade Oten, opposed to he, was, he only caught the ball one time in the first half. And it didn't seem like Utah really changed their game plan and it ended up costing them. And I know that there was a lot of, there was a really bad lack of performance on both sides of the ball for Utah in the second half. But this one might come down to coaching. It could come down to strategy a little bit. And I know that um, the offensive coordinator was taking quite a bit of heat last night after the game. And I, yeah, I, it, I agree. It does seem like it was like, like they just switched jerseys at halftime. My mom even fully said to me this morning, she's like, was there body snatchers or something? Because it was just night and day. It was two different teams. Like I, and the thing is, is I'm more upset about the offense's performance in the second half than I am the defense's. Agreed. Because the defense was still in the game for a good chunk of it. They had Monte Davis had that good interception that we could have we could have like extended our lead and made it another two possession game if not by Jordan's fumble. Mm-hmm. But I'm more upset about the the offense and how the offense performed in the second half. In the second half it looked like we were back to playing USC. There was bad interceptions from um, Bentley. Jordan had that fumble, but I'm not the thing is about the Jordan fumble is yes, it was a backbreaker, but at the uh, on the other side of it, that was his. He's a freshman. I'm not gonna be. I'm not gonna call for him to be benched. I'm not gonna call for him to be like shut down. It was a. It was a mistake. 
he's going to learn from it. The coaches obviously trusted him again because he went back into the game after that, after that, that fumble. Right. So I'm just more upset with the offense, but I think the big, I think my biggest, like one, like the biggest play that stands out to me is that freaking QB sneak on the fourth down. You had Solomon Enos coming around the backside. Toss it to him. He has well, the speed. It looked like a play option. It looked yeah. like he, I mean, regardless if it wasn't, all it takes is a there you go. Here's the football. Yeah, exactly. And like Enos could Enos could get the edge. Enos has the speed to get the edge and get the yard and we're and Utah's moving downfield again. Well, and two Washington linebackers came on a blitz. Mm-hmm. And so he would have he would have that edge. It was a stacked box. That is the that that right there is the stupidest play call that Ludwig he had. There was a lot of really problematic play calls in this game. I will say that, but this QB sneak on a fourth and one when you have a wide receiver coming off of the edge and you could have just done it a simple shovel, a simple shovel to get the edge when you had two linebackers in the box blows my mind. It blows well, my mind that that's what they went with. It's just it's tough that that was the choice when Ty was having a good game on the ground and even Brumfield and Wilmore were averaging enough yards to get that first down. Yeah, all of the running backs were having a good game. Every single carry was was more than they needed for that. I think it was what fourth and two. It was like a fourth and fourth and one, fourth and two. It was a short. It was a short situation. I just think like, any QB sneak that's not fourth and inches is often not a great decision unless yeah. you have someone like a Tyler Huntley who has the athleticism and the strength to get that. Sure, Bentley was okay with his legs, but I, that just is a questionable play call. You have two, you, so you have Ty Jordan who is averaging nine point six yards a carry. You have Devin Brumfield who is averaging three point nine, and you have Jordan Wilmore who is averaging three. That is plenty. That is plenty. That is plenty. Or, or how about this? How about this idea? You run Brant on just like a like a little post, a little mm-hmm. post. Oh, small would... in, a small inside post with any of your wide receivers, with with Thompson, with with Covey, with Covey. any of those guys. A small, quick inside post, especially Covey. Covey, his role two years ago was to move the chains. He didn't score a single touchdown in 2018, although he passed for one. But <laughs> he had over 600 yards receiving, and it was all because he could be trusted to, to get those short plays, to get the third um, third and short or fourth, you know, whatever it is. Put the freaking ball in his hands. But I want to – okay, so yes, the offense was really disappointing in the second half. with, And that fourth down play is just going to – that's going to be sitting in the back of my mind for years to come now. Um, it has replaced that really bad, questionable interception that Utah had against UW in the Pac-12 championship in 2018. But we'll 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 digress with that. Um, the defense, I feel like, kind of like started to play it safe. They started playing safe in the second half. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there was less blitzes in the second half than there were in the first half. It seemed to be that way, and in the first half, uh, the 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 announcers were, were making comments about how uh, the Utah defense was doing a really good job of disguising the secondary, especially on that, that initial interception um, that took place. The quarterback, Washington's quarterback, didn't see him behind his own receiver. Fabian, was, Fabian played that really well. He Fabian did. Was, and, and, and then he also had the, other, the almost interception too. And it was the same strategy. Mm-hmm. He was hidden on both of those, and they stopped doing that. I feel like they kind of backed off, and the slot opened up immensely in the second half for Washington. The last thing I want to say about this before we jump to the second topic is you, the Utah defensive line was, able to, was handling that, that UW offensive line. They were talking pregame about how this was like a big offensive line for UW. How like all of them are like six plus, six foot plus, and then like two hundred and fifty pounds plus. And they were talking about how like these are people movers. No, they were being moved by the Utah defensive line because they only had ninety seven yards rushing total, or eighty seven, eighty eight. Their net yard was eighty eight. Ty Jordan had more himself. Ty, yeah, Ty Jordan had more yards himself than the whole running back room of Washington, who they said was really good. 
Yeah. So I mean, honestly, Sammy, this wasn't. I don't really blame the defense. If the offense would have scored a single touchdown in the second half, Utah would have walked away with the victory. Utah's defense did everything they could to win that football game. So I, they, I really don't put, I really don't put much blame on them. I don't. They set up the Utah defense was putting the offense in a position to score, yep. and the offense was just not able to capitalize on that. Well, and I, I think that the two of the three interceptions didn't turn into scoring drives or plays. Well, uh, there was the one that halftime, and then there was the right. one that led to the Jordan fumble or the Ty Jordan fumble. Right. So Washington scored on two interceptions off of two interceptions where Utah's offense didn't do anything with them. So, yeah, defense, you're you're good. You're defense, defense, you guys are you guys are good in our books this week. <laughs> where it counts. Where where it counts. Okay. So, we've already we've already talked a lot about Ty Jordan and what he's done. Um, has this freshman class impressed us thus far in the season? Cole, I'll let you I'll let you start off with this. Yeah, uh, Ty Jordan is quickly becoming one of my new favorite Offensive players. Um, separating Over Keithy? Over Keithy. No, not yet. <laughs> but I'm just glad that I feel like we have someone that's beginning to separate themselves from the rest of that rushing committee. Um, yeah. And he's outplaying upperclassmen, which is really impressive to me. And it's be- I think it's because he really – he understands – He's not like other – he's not like other backs, I feel. No, he's not. I think he's – I think he is – Moss-esque, Moss-like, in that he, every single play, every single down matters to him, regardless of what he's doing. If he's getting the ball or not, he's making smart plays. And uh, last night against Washington, you know, we already touched on this. He had 97 yards on the ground on 10 attempts. That is almost a first down for every single time he was running the football, which is unfortunate. Again, kind of what I said earlier, the coaching staff, needs to start giving this kid the ball more. I mean, 10 attempts, that's pretty good. But the fact that he had to share so many other attempts with the other two guys that were less than desirable, I'd say. I think the thing is with the Utah running backs is all of them do different things. Yeah. Like Ty Jordan and Jordan Wilmore, I think, are more fast backs. And I think Brumfield's more of like a bruising back. So I can understand why you would run Brumfield when you're on the goal line. Right. As opposed to running Jordan, Ty Jordan, or Jordan Wilmore. Um, I can understand why you do that, but then I think it also depends against the like the defenses you're playing. Right. Well, and it forces the defense to second guess themselves and make it, you know, in game adjustments where it's like, okay, Ty Jordan just scorched us for 10 yards. Here comes a completely different back in Brumfield and, and Wilmore. Um, but, anyways, going back to Ty Jordan. He also had 31 receiving yards, which was the second bo- most by any Utah receiver last night. Um, so it's clear he can not only take the football, you know, out of the backfield, but he he's also a pretty good receiving option, which I like. Yeah, and and some of the things that I've started to see, I there's small glimpses that make me think could this be the second coming of Moss because he's not only similar in size and nature, but his play style. And Coach Witt said last night in the in the press conference. He's going to do big things um, and have a great future for this program. I will add this about Moss before I let you continue on. Um, I was reading the like the post game like stats and stuff and like facts. Jordan or yeah, Ty Jordan put up the most yards as a freshman in a game since Zach Moss did it when he when he played San Diego State or San Jose State. My bad. That I feel like that's good. I like that. I like him. I think he's great. Well, and think about Zach Moss was doing it against San Jose State. Jordan just did it against Washington, who was supposed to have one of the best rushing defenses in the Pac-12 with mm-hmm. all their linebackers and such. So I, I'm really impressed with him so far. So that's that's my little my little spiel on Ty Jordan. Sammy, I know there's a couple other freshmen that you've had you've been impressed with so far. I've been impressed with Ty Jordan. Like as of right now, he's like one of my offensive MVPs of the season because he's just so good. I will say he's he's already this season Ty Jordan has 129 yards and he's averaging 6.7 yards or 7.6 yards per carry. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. That's like putting you into second and manageable or third and short, depending on when you put when you put the ball in his hands. But I'm more impressed as much as I am impressed with Jordan for, with Ty on the offense, I'm more impressed with a lot of the guys in the secondary. You know, I, I talked my I talked my crap 
about the Utah secondary a lot last week and also a lot preseason. And I will say there's three guys on this, this secondary that are looking really good, in my opinion. So the first one is Fabian Marks. Yes, he had the big the interception for 28 yards last night, and then he also had a second one. I like him. I think that he he's going to be good. People, he wears number 23. Do you know who also wore number 23 at Utah? Julian Blackman. And I think that he has the level to be up to where he might be as good as Julian one day. Like he's, I'm really impressed with what he's done in the two games. It, we didn't see much of him in week one against USC, but we last night we saw him and he had a big impact, like right from the jump. Um, I'm also really impressed with Nate Ritchie. Um, he had he, up to this point in the season, he's had 12 total tackles, seven of which are solo. And he's had like half a tackle for loss. It's hard to play safety in the Pac-12, I feel, because you have there's so many really good wide receivers, and I think Nate is really good. People like Whittingham preseason was comparing him to Chase Hansen. I think that he might get up to that level. Like it's going to take like we're seeing these. We're going through some. We're going to have some growing pains with the secondary, which is what I'm going to talk about with my third person. We're going to have some growing pains, but I think this secondary is going to really shape out, and it's going to be a really good secondary. We've already seen. The growth of them from week from game one to game two. So what is it going to look like at by game four of next season? What's it going to look like? But the third one I've been impressed with is um, Clark Phillips the third. You know, we love him. We love him here on Ute Dash. And by we, I mean me. Um, he's had thirteen tackles so far this season. And guess what, Cole? Do you want to hear? Do you want to hear something really fun, Cole? Yes. All of them have been solo tackles. I love it. All of them, all 13. And he's had one tackle for loss. But has he been beat on some really manageable plays? Yes. I'm talking about that that really easy touchdown that USC scored on the on the post that was just like, it, he just got beat. Yes, he's gotten beat. Will he get over it? Yes. He already looked better yesterday than he did against USC. And I think that they are all looking really good and there's like there's a bunch of other guys that i'm not mentioning that are making good plays you have sioni Fotu, you have kamoi lay too you have a bunch of guys out there making plays that are freshmen and i'm really impressed with this class this proves why this was one of utah's greatest classes that we've ever signed because they're they're making these impact plays now yeah and you know those three guys fabian richie cp3 um they have moments where their youthfulness shines through you know i mean they get beat they you know fabian dropped a second interception because i think he had the end zone on his mind rather than making making the full catch and you know richie's been beat a few times on the ground so that that youthfulness shines through but it's meant to shine through they're freshmen for heaven's sakes but they as well have impressed me you know each is making big time plays um that you wouldn't expect from freshmen uh they're making them in the pac 12 um, like you said, a lot of good receivers. I, I think that you know when you look uh, when you look at the Pac-12 offensively, it's probably better well known for its receivers rather than you know it's the guys coming out of the backfield, right? Mm -hmm. um, except for of course Zach Moss in Utah, um, but they're in the Wit and Scally defensive system, so it just comes with the gig and ex the gig and experience will benefit each of these guys. So, Sammy, I fully expect you know, towards the end of next season, maybe the beginning of the third season, you know, when, when they're, they're looking at maybe um, their junior year or whatever these guys decide to do since um, since uh, the NCAA is kind of frozen eligibility, uh, they could, we could be looking at a defense very similar to the one we've been accustomed to over the last two to three years with Blackman and Johnson and, you know, all those guys. Burgess, just, like yeah. a, a no-fly zone secondary. Absolutely. I fully expect that, to, these guys, to elevate their game and to be at that level uh, fairly quickly. So I like that you talked about experience because that brings us to our final topic of tonight. What is the biggest issue that needs to be fixed with Utah? I'm going to jump on this first because I – because like I want to talk about experience because that's what I think is one of the, the things that'll help fix these issues is is experience. These young guns are learning from their mistakes, and we won't be in this position next year or the year after that. Like yes, there, this is a growing like there's going to be growth spurts. There's going to be good games and there's going to be bad games and there's going to be everything in the middle. And 
I we already saw a jump from game one against USC to game two against Washington. I like what are what is this team going to look like next year when you have UCLA at home or you're on the road in the Coliseum versus USC? How is this team going to look? I think that they're going to there there's still going to be mistakes that are going to be made last year, but I don't think they're going to be as common as they are right now. Um, I think, and I think the only thing that needs to be fixed, like right now, doesn't go. This is not going to go onto the players. This is going to go onto the coaching staff. Is they need to work on, like, work. Keep doing what is working. Keep doing what is working. You last week against USC, you gave up on Ty early on, and it didn't end well. This week, you guys gave Ty more time. And it, it, it showed it, like he was able to do stuff, but you kind of gave up on a little bit of like your offensive or uh, on your pass game and stuff like that. And then on the defensive side versus USC, you guys, you went from straight from playing zone coverage, which you guys were really good at locking down USC rec- receivers on that. And you switched to man and you get beat. And this week you cut back on the, on the blitzes, you, you go soft, not soft, but you take your foot off the gas and you're not playing that true hard-nosed Utah defense that we're used to seeing. And I can, you can't blame the players for this. The players are just doing the plays that their coaches are telling them to do. Right. And I, I think, I don't know if it's the coaches not believing in this young team or what it is, but it needs to be fixed because we saw in this first half of this Utah game that what they're capable of doing. And then when the second half came, it was the polar opposite team that we saw. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that um, I think really applies to freshmen and sophomores, especially in, in college football, is they don't have that experience mm-hmm. that makes them really special. You know, those freshmen and sophomores, they are – they're just regurgitating what the coaching staff is telling them to do. They're they're like robots, right? Which which can be good, you know, in, in a in a wit and a scally system. That's not a bad thing. To, it's not. It's not a bad way to play because they're going to tell you the right thing to do. However, as you get into that junior and senior year, because of the experience, they're then able to make reads and really good reads and and base their decision making off of their own experience and make really big time plays wrap and, and combine that with what the coaching staff is telling them to do. And so I think at this point in the season, you know, what we're, are we four weeks in now, Sammy? We're technically three games in, but I think overall the conference is heading into week five. I don't know. I'm right. just counting on how many games we've played. And right now we've played two. Right. So technically that was week four and this is now we're coming into week five, correct? Yeah, I think. Yeah. I'm pretty, yeah. So, right. so there's what, two games of, Technically, two games left. There's two scheduled games, and then there's like that, like final week, which is like a weird, like round robin, weird pairing up thing. I don't know. Right. So Utah, you're sitting at zero and two. The coaching staff at this point, this season is you're not you're not in the running for the Pac-12 South. You're not going to go to a bowl game probably gonna, either. Well, I, I think everybody qualifies, but you're not going to go to a very oh, good bowl game. Oh, not in the Pac-12. Larry Scott put in that like stipulation that teams must finish above 500 to make a bowl game this year. Wonderful. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> so okay, so then it, then at this point, it should just be experimentation. It should be, you know, trying different things in in practice um, and just giving these kids as much experience. Even if, let's say, Clark Phillips has a bad game. Keep him in the game. Keep let him continue to get experience and learn from those mistakes. Not that I'm saying they would pull him, but just it's kind of a throwaway season. It's getting to that point, especially I don't know how Utah is favored to beat Oregon State after what they just did to the Ducks. I don't but know either, but I'm just gonna I'm just I'm just here for the ride at this right. point. Right. But if you drop to 0 and three, <laughs> give Ty Jordan 20 attempts in the backfield, you know? Keep these freshmen out there on the defensive end because experience is the only thing that's going to help you moving to next season. But, Sammy, there are quite a few things. Wait, sorry, I can think. I add one thing before? Yes, you go ahead. Yours? Go ahead. You're talking about experience like juniors and seniors. I think it also benefits these guys a lot that, like, 
this is not like the NFL where like your schedule kind of rotates a lot and right. like you don't know who's going to play who like what teams you're going to play every single year except for the members of your division. Right. Utah knows that they're going to play USC, UCLA, Arizona, Arizona State and Colorado every single year. They know that. You learn things about these guys on these teams because you play them every single year. Right. And because most of them will stay all four years. There's the exception like a Jalen Johnson who decides to go to the NFL or like anyone else who's, who declares as a junior. Mm -hmm. But most of these guys, you're going to play four years against them. Maybe three if they don't play as a freshman. But you're still you're going to learn how these guys play. And it's something that you can just file into the back of your head and keep for the next year. It's not like the NFL where you – I'm not saying that this happens in the NFL, but like the Buccaneers played the Chiefs today. Are the Bucs going to play the Chiefs next year? I don't know. We don't know because that's how the NFL schedules work. So they're able to, like, Clark Phillips can know, okay, so if I line up against this wide receiver from USC next year, this is what I need to do. Right. You can file that information into your head. Absolutely. So that's, sorry, that's a little tangent. Oh, you're good. So you can now, now go, go off. <laughs> you're good. You're good. So my take on what needs to change is surprisingly – Surprisingly, the biggest issue thus far has been the offense. Which nine, we didn't think which we didn't think was going to be the issue. We thought it was going to be the defense was going to be the issue. Nine turnovers in the last two games. I think it took last year's team like 10 games to get to nine turnovers. Bentley has four interceptions in his first two games as a Utah quarterback, which that took Huntley all of last season to do. And he played and, more games. And there are times like the first – what's frustrating, though, is there are times like the first half where Bentley looks fully capable to run the offense. Last night he was great with his legs, made pretty good decisions, and threw for a touchdown. The second half he comes out, struggles to complete a dang thing, throws t a terrible interception, which I believe Washington then turned into a score, and he just completely ignores the best receivers on the team. And – so, so as we as we look into that, Keithy had four receptions for twenty three yards. One but, that's more than, but isn't that more than he had against USC too? I believe so, but not. So it's like it, it, it's getting it. We're getting up there. We're getting there. I think it's he had twenty. While. I think he had eighteen or twenty one against USC. Okay, so it's not that much more. Never mind. <laughs> Give my guy like, I, he needs to be hit at least double that, and I'm hoping that he's producing at least 50 to 75 yards. Like, that's a minimum. But BT did look pretty good. Yes, BT he did. Good. He did. But everybody else really didn't. I mean, going back to Keithy, this is the best tight end in the state, and he's only getting the ball four times. He should, he should have been targeted how Washington was targeting their tight end. Yeah. And Keithy, there was one play in particular last night, and Sammy, we were talking about it. Oh my God. Keithy was wide open. I think it was a third down. It was a third down. It was like a third and five, third and six. And instead of passing to him, Bentley threw, throws into double coverage, and the Utes ended up punting. Also, Keithy was like four, three or four yards past the sticks, if I'm remembering correctly. So you get the first down plus some more yardage. Yep. Like, he need, Bentley needs to go through his progressions better, and I think he needs to – he needs to think a little bit more because he needs to like let things play out because yes, Keithy was double teamed, but he wasn't double teamed as much as he was against USC. That's because they weren't throwing the freaking ball his way. So Washington's like, I'm not going to worry about him. So and, and, like, that's the thing is like, I think Utah, like I don't, I'm not saying Utah needs to like on their first play from offense, like go 65 yards down the field to Keithy. No, like surprise them, surprise them with a Keithy attack. Exactly. Like don't just don't just like shove Keithy down their throat because then they're gonna start double teaming him. Right, right. Well, we have enough guys that we don't have to do that. We have three really great tight ends. We have four other really great receivers, and one of them, Covey, didn't have a single reception last night. I think he was targeted one time, and that time turned into an interception, interception. as Bentley under severely underthrew him. Um, okay. You know, t like you were t mentioning, Thompson Ennis are good. But I just think Keithy and Covey should be the guys that you are marching down the field with, especially because, like I mentioned earlier, that was Covey's role in 2018. The guy had over 600 yards, not a single touchdown, but look at what Utah did in 2018. Um, and just, you know, my last, my last little thought here, 
I know that Bentley, I was on that Bentley train leading up to the season. And to my defense, you were the I, captain of the Bentley train. I think that you should expect an SEC quarterback transfer who put up really good numbers his first two seasons to be a really good quarterback in the Pac-12, especially with the 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 arsenal of, of wide receivers um, that he has. Now, I understand that you know he wasn't supposed to be the starting guy, so the chemistry isn't necessarily there. But let me just say this. The first half is why I was on that Bentley train. The second half makes me want to hold up pictures of Huntley and cry myself to sleep at night remembering how good we had it. And with that, we will wrap things up. That was, that was a lovely picture that you put in my mind. But before we head out, we just wanted to remind you guys that we are writing columns now through Sports Pack 12. You can hit them up on Twitter at Sports Pack 12 and also check out their website at sportspack12.com. While you're on your computer, um, check out our website, dashsports.tv. Make sure you're also following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch at dashsportstv. <sighs> we're we're going to see how this week goes against Oregon State. I don't know. I'm not. Nine points seems generous, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. So, as always, Cole, do you want to send the, the good folks out with the lovely Go Utes? I will. Go Utes, guys.